Hello, welcome everybody. It's a little bit more crowded in here than it was at six when we went to close. Right? Um, many of you may remember a few months ago we acknowledged that um, our superintendent had been acknowledged, and so he was unable to attend any kind of celebration. So before we begin with our regular meeting, I would like to welcome Dr. Hank Thiele, the superintendent of District 99, and some of his other fellow uh, DuPage County superintendents mm -hmm. here to celebrate Dr. Russell, who was awarded the IASA Superintendent of Distinction honor this year. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. thank you, and thank you for helping us arrange this surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I am surprised, so thank you. <laughs> Good evening, neighbors. Uh, this past spring, Dr. Kevin Russell was named as the Superintendent of Distinction from the DuPage region of the Illinois Association of, Ad of Administrators. Uh, superintendents of Distinction are selected by their peers in each of the 21 different IASA regions based on leadership, communication, professionalism, and community involvement. These are superintendents that other superintendents see as difference makers in the communities they serve. So here to present to today, obviously, I'm Hank Thiele. Dan Rich. Katie McCoskey. Mark Cross. And uh, Kevin was nominated by Katie, uh, who is the superintendent of Bensonville District 2, who recognized that Kevin is an outstanding leader who has continued to persevere through some very challenging personal times. She noted that Kevin never loses sight of student learning and is always willing to collaborate, brainstorm, and build relationships to meet the needs of students and the county. As his partner superintendent here in Downers Grove, I can tell you that Kevin is an amazing educator that makes all of those around him better. Schools across DuPage County in the state of Illinois are better because Kevin is here as a resource for all of us to draw from. We are all inspired by his work here in District 58, especially through implementing a strategic plan, keeping the community well informed through a referendum, a successful one by the way, <laughs> and ultimately major facility improvements. He led all of this while focusing on the instructional and social emotional needs of students here in Downers Grove. He is the type of superintendent that many of us aspire to be. And for that, we have recognized him as the 2024 Superintendent of Distinction. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be dis discussed. This can be uh, placed in the basket at that table over there to my right. I have a lot of 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to go ahead and start out with our non-action reports. Listed on tonight's agenda um, is one communication received by the board. Are there any other communication board members would like to share at this time? 
I would just like to acknowledge that over the weekend we did get one email regarding the action that we're taking tonight on uh, the personal development, personal learning Mondays, uh, professional learning Mondays, mm -hmm. um, which I responded to as well, but that didn't make it before the Friday cutoff, so it was not on uh, tonight's agenda. All right, that brings us up to the first spotlight. Uh, the spotlight on our school is the uh, plan year one update. So Dr. Russell, kick it up. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very excited to update the community on our strategic planning process over the last year. If you recall, uh, Dr. Madonia, who is here in the audience, led our community. We had over 100 people write our strategic plan that included many, many staff members. So we want to thank our staff, many administrators, and many community members, some parents and some just general community members. So we're very pleased of the progress that we made. Uh, for the presentation tonight, we're going to cover a few objectives. The first thing that we want to do is we, we, we excuse me, we want to recap the first year of the plan. We want to update, uh, provide the update that we provided to our DLT, our district leadership team on the five focus areas. We sought feedback from the DLT and then we're going to bring everybody back and really just show what we plan on doing for the next school year. So with that, I'd like to bring Dr. Madonia up and have Dr. Madonia share with us an overview of the strategic planning process, what makes a successful plan, and then the assistant superintendents will cover their areas. Thank you, Dr. Madonia, okay. welcome back. Thank you very much, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight to celebrate with you all the accomplishments that have been, accomplished, have been taken place in the last 12 months. And so uh, it's a very exciting time. I would like to just give a little bit of an overview of where we started and where we ended and uh, to tell you a little bit about our process. We started the process out by reviewing, refining, and enhancing the mission statements, vision statements, and core values. Uh, very, very important and uh, that, was, that was completed. And then we moved on to uh, working together to brainstorm out what was the most important things to study in our strategic plan. We call that the focus areas of study. And we did identify uh, focus on learning, securing the future, building for success, connecting with the community, and cultivating talent. And I think those are very excellent areas. And I think we, we identified those and then we actually uh, took some time out to solicit stakeholder feedback on all of those areas so that the community would be totally and completely engaged, uh, which I think is the beauty of this process. It is collaborative and engaging and brings the community and the district together for one common goal, and that's for the welfare of the students of District 58. So uh, we started doing that by developing a survey which we put out to all stakeholders um, and ask for their feedback, uh, not only in terms of questions that were asked that we uh, posed, but also for comments for them to give us written feedback about what they felt was important in those five focus areas. Um, we put that data all together uh, into a summary report uh, highlighting the key components of that and we brought that to our strategic long-range planning committee which Dr. Russell already referenced which was well over a hundred people uh, and it was a beautiful time to bring the community together with the district. Uh, we spent two days with that committee um, over and a total of seven hours of collaborating and planning um, and we presented to them the data from the survey um, as one piece of data because they, during that seven hours over two days, brought forth a lot of other data to the table for us to plan with. And so we, we really felt that was really rewarding. And I think everyone, based on the evaluation of our two days, was overwhelmingly supportive of the fact that their voices were heard, that they thought the five focus areas were very relevant to the needs of District 58, and that it was, it met and exceeded their expectations uh, for what the strategic planning process would be with the committee. And I think all of that data 
was in the 95 to 100 percent level of satisfaction and I think that was really impressive and, and showed that we made a mark with our community. Um, and then the results of our two days of work was to identify the top two goals in each of our five focus areas. And then on top of that, to have the depth in the plan of three additional priorities that we are looking forward to as we achieve a goal, we move a priority up and they become a goal. So the plan has a lot of depth, it has a lot of meat, and uh, really is, it is really well put together by all people that were involved in this process. Um, and then what we did after that was to have the administrators focus on a roadmap through action plans and the development of objectives to get us to achievement of those goals. How are we going to get there? What is the roadmap to outcomes? And so they developed the action plans. And I thought, to be honest with you, and I think I referenced this at the board meeting when you approved the strategic plan, that I felt that the administrative team did a phenomenal job on putting those action plans together. And I work in many school districts and have done so many different plans and the work they did truly stands out among all of them. So my compliments to the administrators on, on that work. Uh, then the next, we put together a brochure for the district which can be used for public relations purposes um, that highlighted all of our goals and objectives and action work and uh, made that complete. Uh, next, we're here for our report out, uh, which is a celebratory time uh, to show that this district, I'm proud to say, has a culture of continuous improvement. The outcomes are very impressive, uh, and my head is off to you uh, for doing a phenomenal job. And as I referenced before, having done so many strategic plans, yours stands out, and the work you have done stands out as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Madonia. <laughs> so for the remainder of the presentation, the assistant superintendents will come up and they will share the highlight of the work that's going on, uh, you know, this year, into the summer, and then into the fall. As a reminder to the board, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, we have really started to use the curriculum workshop in October for our annual review on the progress and what we're tackling in that year as well. So we look forward to the October board meeting where we'll provide uh, further updates as well. You will see on the uh, slideshow that's attached to board docs, the things that are highlighted in yellow are what we attempted to tackle this year. And we wanted to separate that just so everyone knew what we were focusing on. Because as a reminder, this is a five-year plan. And over the course of the five years, we've committed to hitting all of these action items. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Liz. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to be discussing our focusing on learning goal, which is goal one of our strategic plan. Our priorities that we set for the first year of our strategic plan was that District 58 will set high expectations for all learners that are designed to meet their individual needs. District 58 will ensure students' availability for learning by building, measuring, and supporting their behavioral and mental health needs. And District 58 will implement a systematic review of multiple forms of data to inform transparent instructional decision making. Now, um, at this time, none of those are complete. As we continue to work on all three of our current priorities, we will also start to build out our last two priorities over the course of this school year. The progress that we made in year one, um, we are excited that the Curriculum Council um, de determined um, finalized language for our high expectations <laughs> definition. That will be shared out with DLT <laughs> with DLT and then to the community through a Communicate 58 as um, we are excited to, to embark on what high expectations for all learners means in District 58. Additionally, we started our systematic data review protocols which ensured that all of our staff members were looking at data using similar language and having similar conversations across buildings and grade levels. We also had our year one implementation of consistent district-wide behavioral expectations and a support plan, which we were really excited about. And our PBSST teams at all of the buildings really spearheaded that work. 
We had a comprehensive K-5 training of zones of regulation, and that implementation started in April, and we will continue that rollout at the beginning of the upcoming school year. Additionally, we had comprehensive mental health um, specialist training and cognitive behavior, um, behavioral therapy programs with many of our support staff. Additionally, we established an attendance committee to begin work on data informed um, on a data informed attendance framework and really analyzing our um, attendance. We know that if students are available and at school, we know that we will see improved outcomes. So it's really important that we are getting all of our students to school um, on a regular basis. As we look ahead to the upcoming school year, we will continue the implementation of those consistent district-wide behavioral expectations and support plans, meshing that with our zones of regulation training and really building a comprehensive approach to our behavioral, the behavioral needs of our students. We will have an elementary pilot of evidence-based staff training that provides educators with proactive strategies for minimizing disruptive behavior. That will be through a train-the-trainer model, which we are looking forward to implementing in next school year. We also will have the implementation of our data-informed attendance framework, really having a systematic approach to informing families um, of their students' attendance, making sure that everyone is aware, but also talking about the benefits of regular school attendance. Additionally, we will explore and determine a measurement tool to better understand the whole child. There are various um, measures that are out there. We really just want to make sure that we're finding one that meets the needs of District 58. And then additionally, we will continue to support staff understanding of available data resources. So we know we have our ECRA model, which I'll be sharing some information during our spring data snapshot later in this meeting. Um, but we also have various other sources of data, and we want to make sure that all of our staff is well versed in how to access that data and how it can be used to inform their um, instructional practices, and then building capacity um, in the use of those resources. Good evening. So Justin and I and Faith all worked in the uh, Connecting with the Community Council. And um, the two goals that we focused on this year were building and enhancing our two-way communication that's equitable, equitable, inclusive, and culturally responsive, and fostering strong relationships, relationships with all families and the extended community. Uh, and we'll, and as has been mentioned previously, we'll continue to work on those next goals in the coming years. So we had some really exciting work that occurred this year, uh, and it did involve the forming of a, of a new council, the Communications and uh, Connections and Communications Council. Um, and, and, it, and it took some work, but even one of the things we identified in our first meetings was that we maybe don't, still don't have the right people in the room. So we did some additional outreach to try to build up some of the representation from different groups um, to really make sure that this group had some solid representation across our community. Uh, and that's obviously something that we'll continue to work on because it's a really important part of the work that we'll be doing. One of the first things we did to kind of establish a baseline is we found a framework, uh, found a framework that we liked, and then we had an analysis of uh, authentic family partnerships. Where we could see where we're at and look for areas of growth. And, and that was a really insightful process. Uh, we did, did it with a few different groups. We did it with, obviously, with the, uh, with the newly formed council. We did it with the uh, superintendent's advisory uh, council. Uh, and we did it with our principal and administrative leadership team. So that gave us some really good data on where some important stakeholders felt we were at and areas that we could grow, and that kind of helped guide some of our work. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to try to tackle initially was potential barriers to communication and access to events. So a really good example of that, something that we looked at uh, in an immediate fashion was open house, and then also looking forward to, uh, to curriculum night in the fall. These are events that have really strong attendance, but not every family is getting there. So what are some barriers, including transportation, and how can we help support with transportation and, and other ways to get families there? And another thing that we're going to do in the fall is really try to get a sense of what families aren't participating, uh, and then reach out to those families and try to get a sense of, of what some of the reasons they may not be, to try to get as many families into our schools as possible when we have those open events, because uh, we think that's a great way to connect with families. Things that we're going to focus on next year is uh, a review of our communication platform. School Messenger is the current platform. Uh, and is that meeting our needs? Are there other tools and opportunities out there to, to better enhance our communications? Uh, you know, focusing obviously on things like uh, translation to multiple languages. That's always a, a challenge and important thing that we're able to do to reach families. 
And then re readability, we've had a lot of conversations about the readability, not, not just talking in, uh, you know, in educational terminology, making the language accessible to people of a, you know, a variety of backgrounds and levels. And so we're gonna really focus in on that. Uh, from the analysis of authentic family partnerships, we're, we're gonna take some of our, our next future objectives with that and try to bring back some professional learning to, admi our, our, to our administrators uh, and our administrative team, and then they can then hopefully take that learning back to the faculty and staff and really think about uh, how we can have culturally, culturally responsive communication that is accessible to all of our stakeholders. Uh, and then another thing that we're gonna focus on next year is consistent activities to welcome new families. We've got a lot of great things happening across all of our buildings, and it's one of the great things about District 58 with, with 13 schools, is there's some really great approaches to how families are welcomed into the building. And I, I think we feel really confident that great things are happening, but how can we learn from, from practices at different schools and have a more uh, consistent and, and, uh, and, and solid approach that can be equitable across all of our buildings. And so we're having some similar experiences. So those are some things that we're gonna focus on next year uh, as we work through the rest of our goals. And I think Todd is gonna speak next about securing our future. Good evening. Uh, we have uh, three of the priority pieces of the Securing the Future, um, working through the referendum process and the, the construction piece that is currently going on in six schools right now, um, continuing the planning of our resources and available uh, for district initiatives and uh, <coughs> meeting those budget uh, requirements, developing uh, a capital plan policy uh, once we've completed uh, the capital work at, at the end of, uh, into the 26-27 year. <clears throat> we are 73% of construction bids already approved and work is, is going on uh, through this summer and we are well on a way of planning uh, and preparing to bid uh, out the summer of 2025 work uh, this fall and those pieces are, are, are well underway and we continually work ahead uh, so that every summer we're we're out earlier uh, in our in our budgeting and our planning process, so that we are uh, driving a market um, as opposed to following it. Um, <coughs> we also, <coughs> excuse me, uh, continually work and plan and, and use our finance our five year financial planning model, and in that position, that spot we. Ask and have the and the board reviews uh, a five-year plan uh, in the spring of every year, early in the process, uh, prior to uh, our budget, uh, the normal budget cycle of uh, being posted in August and, and approved in September. But really looking at that piece um, <clears throat> well in advance to ensure that as we are m managing and going through our, our planning of programs, we can sustain uh, the framework and format. Um, you know, prior to that, that budget implementation. So continually work through that. We use our year-to-date reports and our monthly um, review to ensure uh, that we're on track with those and, and where we're at um, and, <coughs> and moving forward with those. The one piece that we need to work on, um, we have in those plans a, a goal or projection, a, a model of a $750,000 transfer into capital from operating. Uh, we have 500,000 for this year, uh, fiscal year 24, that will take place at the end of this month. Um, but then looking at a $750,000 uh, mark after that, uh, so that there is funds available once those uh, referendum bond dollars uh, do complete itself in 2027. Um, one piece that we are still working on and need to will work on through this fall is the development of a, a capital policy uh, that uh, <coughs> puts into stone as part of that plan a, a formal process or a formal structure for the board uh, to to review uh, to ensure that that is there moving forward. So, and that part will happen through FAC and then up up through the board. Jessica. 
So uh, Building for Success really is off to a solid start as we look to, it, it was really a foundation laying year uh, where we looked at two major priorities, the first being the development of a 6-8 middle school model uh, that focuses especially on uh, not only that model that students will experience, but also paying really special attention to the transition needs of, of families, of staff, and of students. Uh, recognizing that that 26-27 school year will have two uh, two grade levels of students transitioning over and will be welcoming, uh, uh, will be in an environment where two-thirds of the students have never done the middle school thing. So we're super excited about it, but it's going to take some careful planning and we've started off um, really kind of diving into what does that look like. Um, Additionally, uh, we wanted to make sure that the focus was also on the elementary uh, buildings as well. So we, as we gain a little bit of that space uh, with sixth graders transitioning up, really taking a look at some of the programmatic, the curricular, and those instructional resource offerings so that uh, as middle school kicks off, we're having that same celebration and embracing of um, some new models at the elementary level as well. Uh, so, you know, we've we've dove into um, some initial building utilization studies. So we've asked our principals to take a look at uh, some initial priorities and give us some feedback on that. Um, in the uh, in the middle school subcommittee, we've established a steering committee uh, made up of a number of uh, different representatives, uh, administration, staff, families, uh, that really is overseeing timelines. Um, and decision-making so that when we get to that 26-27 school year uh, everything has fallen into place so mapping that out was a great accomplishment and we are sticking to uh, to those deadlines and moving forward and aligning uh, what is going to be some very important work which I'll talk about in a second uh, and then we've uh, started to look really at evidence-based middle school models so you know the students that we're serving today are very different than the students that we served 10 or 15 years ago and so the models that we used to offer don't necessarily embrace the full student in the same way so we're really looking at what are some things we can um, structure in our I within our buildings to really make sure that uh, the middle level learner is having their needs met and then uh, finally we've been uh, working to gather uh, feedback regarding uh, implementation both at the middle school and then uh, also starting the building utilization work. Uh, and all of that is uh, setting the stage for making decisions about uh, the middle school schedule, which is such a driver of so many other important middle school pieces uh, that come into play, uh, and also then the staffing that's going to support that. So the goal is that uh, both of those things are solidified by the end of next school year so that we have an entire year to really um, explore the impact of that, to ensure that uh, if moves are happening, that people uh, have have some anticipation of that. Um, we're looking then also to finalize the elementary transitional schedule next year so that um, PTAs and elementary principals, uh, fifth and sixth grade teachers uh, can really make sure that we make that time special for our students. Um, and then finally, uh, take a look at building utilization in the K-6 environment uh, to make sure that we are um, utilizing space uh, to the max to support instructional programming for all. Under the goal of cultivating talent, we had two areas of focus this year to analyze and explore current staffing practices and potential staffing practices to ensure that we are achieving equity for students and also to look at opportunities for students, again, with an equity lens to explore and develop their own individual talents. And so this being one of our newer goal areas, we really did this work with one existing group, which was the District Equity Leadership Team, and one sort of reformed group. We reformed the Resources Review Council, which was formed under the prior strategic plan, but then did sunset after that work had sort of been completed. And so during this first year, we spent some time reviewing those practices in, in, in staffing and the way we do things now with some focus areas identified. The district equity leadership team took a look at our current gifted and acceleration data and what that looks like. And we did put together a survey for families and staff regarding our current extracurricular and co-curricular opportunities for students. 
We did begin all of this work. I would say realistically this will be ongoing in these first two objectives as we get into the beginning of next year. In terms of that staffing equity, we really looked at that allocation for how we are supporting student behavior and social emotional needs across the district. The analogy we've used is that 10 years ago we were very excited to have one reading specialist in each of our 13 elementary buildings regardless of size or student need. And 10 years later we know that that's probably not the most accurate way to allocate those resources, but it took us some time to build a model that didn't take away from one building to give to another, but rather slowly grew that model with a way to allocate that support that was equitable across buildings based upon identified student needs. So we want to begin to focus our efforts in the area of allocating behavioral and SEL support to students across all buildings in a similar fashion over the next several years. We want to continue to analyze the survey data that did come back around student interests, family interests, and how to provide those opportunities for students across all 13 buildings in a way that is equitable and accessible. We will continue to look at gifted acceleration data and criteria and make sure that there aren't barriers for students, that we're identifying students in a consistent way and that the programming is matching the students that we're identifying. And then we want to start to look to the next objectives in this goal area, which really focus on continuing to find ways to celebrate all of the talents that we have among our students and staff and make sure that as we're going through recruitment efforts, we are focusing on recruiting a staff that represents the larger community of Downers Grove and our school district as we move so to sum it up in next steps before I get to the individual next steps I want to thank two board members uh, both member Doshi and member Weiner they serve on the DLT which oversees the implementation of the strategic plan so thank you for all your feedback and phone calls and all of those things um, also I want to thank the assistant superintendents they have done a fabulous job uh, working on this uh, several meetings in the evening before school uh, and then of course I want to thank our staff for participating in uh, coming well after hours to uh, do this work so thank you to our staff and then of course Dr. Madonia for your leadership uh, we have four more years to go on this plan it is far from finished but I know Dr. Madonia is only a phone call or an email or a text message away and that's something that we really appreciate thank you very much so uh, the next steps obviously tonight we're updating the board Development teams will continue throughout the summer and the fall to process the feedback we've received from the DLT and the working groups. Uh, development teams will determine which priorities will then be addressed in school year 24 and 25, likely be one to two more principals for each. Um, an action plan for next school year will be shared at the October curriculum workshop. That's where we'll go over who, what, where, when, and how. And then we'll do another annual review just like this next June where we share with the community after sharing with the DLT um, the progress that we've made. So any questions that uh, the board may have for our work? Nothing, questions coming? We had a lot of really good feedback um, from the DLT. Uh, DLT is comprised of uh, mainly staff members, two board members, the admin team, and then also we have a parent representative from the north side and a parent representative uh, from the south side as well. So we'll continue to utilize that format. But thank you again for the presentation. Yeah, and thank you for such a smooth transition from our old strategic plan to this one. I, you know, it's really appreciated with all the things we got going on. So uh, great job. All right, next up we have another spotlight. This one is our spring data snapshot and climate survey. Welcome back. All right, good evening again, board. So um, this evening I will share our spring data snapshot with you. Some of tonight's objectives, we're going to provide a district level overview of our spring 2024 benchmarking data, which includes MAP and AIMSWeb. We're gonna share initial interpretations and responses to data, including steps to be taken over the summer and into the fall. We want to acknowledge that the final 2023-2024 data review and our key performance indicator review will occur in the fall when we can include our final IAR data. We want to recognize the opportunities that all data review provides us from the district level to the individual student level. And then we want to provide a district level overview of our spring 2024 climate survey data, which Faith will share, as well as a snapshot of communication preference and satisfaction survey. 
So I just wanted to bring everyone's attention back to what our key performance indicators are. The district continues to use our snapshot data reports as a mean to review our students' path to academic achievement and growth. These are merely snapshots, benchmark data, which provides us the opportunity to respond to student learning and growth. Um, our key performance indicators are the measurement to which we determine if we have met our goals. So we do have an academic proficiency key performance indicator, which has us um, at a benchmark of being in the 75th percentile for reading in the state as well as the 80 bless you as well as the 85th percentile for math in the state so remembering that the percentile that we are in in the state doesn't necessarily um, correlate specifically to our percents meeting or exceeding but really compares us to all of the elementary school districts in the state of Illinois Additionally, our second key performance indicator is our academic growth indicator. So this allows us to take a look at our IAR and MAP data and um, ensure that the percentage of students demonstrating expected or higher than expected growth on those measurements. Um, our benchmark is 85%. So overall, as we look at our spring data, our impressions show us that um, as we're reviewing data at the highest level, District 58 is within our expected growth range, taking into consideration our MAP and our MAP for all grade levels and our Ames Web for grades um, kindergarten and first. Our 2023-2024 growth projections were based on our final growth reports from 2022 and 2023. So if you remember when we moved to that ECRA model, our spring data really informs what our growth expectations are for the entire next school year, and that's where our data snapshots come into play. Um, so when we see that, we did have some of um, District 58's highest growth scores since the pandemic um, in the last school year, 2022-2023. And so we did recognize that we saw some some ebbs and flows within our map data um, consistent to, um, to the um, growth scores that were from last school year. In um, our initial review, all of our elementary schools are within that expected growth range in both reading and math. Um, for our middle schools, O'Neill showed expected growth in reading, but showed lower than expected growth in math, something that we have seen as, as a bit of a trend. Um, and similarly, Herrick showed lower than expected growth in both subjects as well. Um, again, this was based um, entirely on our MAP data reports. Additionally, grade level growth through ECRA, when we're looking at MAP, it continues to kind of be up and down. So that's something that we want to really make sure that we are honing in on those grade levels and those schools that are, are seeing um, quite a bit of success. And how do we replicate that? How do we ensure that teams are talking to each other, doing, um, having professional learning opportunities and time to be in each other's classrooms, observe one another, ask questions, um, and really kind of um, be partners in reviewing their data and observing their instructional practices. And additionally, if, if um, any of our groups of teachers are, are seeing any type of struggle, how can we support them? What additional pieces need to be put into play so that we can continue to see that growth moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, when we see that, that back and forth of our MAP growth reports, it really is something that we, we um, take a look at because it's not necessarily indicative of our comparison to last year's IAR scores. As as well as our preliminary IAR data um, that we have um, started to review. Our trend data continues to show growth across buildings and grade levels. And then I do want to remind the board um, and the community that our growth data is not available for students in grades four and five who took the math map um, six plus assessment um, based on their accelerated placement. But I will say that we are reviewing that NWEA NWEA has changed um, their guidance and is, is um, looking to have everyone take the grade level assessment that's at, on their current grade level. So we would like to see that data put back into our reports so we wouldn't change that in the middle of a school year, which is why we continued this practice through the remainder of this year in our spring data um, or in our spring administration. But we are going to look to have our fourth and fifth graders um, who are in our accelerated programming take the um, math the MAP math grades two through five assessment for the upcoming school year. I did share a few slides um, that have been shared in all of our data snapshots, just as a reminder to what um, our ECRA model looks at. So they take last year's performance. They, um, from that, they provide an individual student composite achievement score, which is their propensity score. They give us future projections. We get the actual scores, and then the ECRA report shows us if they made, if students made expected growth. 
again, just talking through what those growth scores mean and on what side um, of that um, effect size our students are ranking. And then here is what the um, information that our reports share with us in terms of any growth um, is being considered expected growth. ECRA uses um, a growth model and shows um, us students who had higher than expected growth, expected growth, lower than expected, or unsatisfactory growth. That is just a, a slide that shows us which assessments the students took. And then as we start going through um, all of our data reports, similar to what I shared, we did see um, lower than expected growth at our middle schools. That was similar in mathematics. Lower than expected growth at Herrick in EL or in reading. Again, all through map data. And then we did still see some of that um, anomaly ebb and flow of data at our intermediate level, fourth and fifth grade in mathematics, as well as seventh and eighth grade. Additionally, that fifth grade group again in reading um, showing lower than expected growth, um, eighth grade as well, everyone else within that expected growth range. We continue to see our um, student group populations showing both expected growth and lower than expected growth in both reading and that, or I'm sorry, in mathematics and then in reading all subgroups made expected growth. As I went through that quickly, um, and that data is available um, in, in board docs um, for anyone's um, review, we do want to talk a little bit about what our review process is. So that data was received on, um, on May 23rd. It, is, it was accessible to all certified staff and administrators. So at the district level, we review the data for the entire system. But really, we give our teachers the opportunity through our tier one um, data meetings to really dive into their data and looking at the groups and individual students that they serve determining if a student has high achievement and maybe just didn't meet their growth target, if they have high achievement and did meet their growth target, um, as well as students who are potentially in that average range, whether or not they made their growth target, what can we do to make sure that we are continuing to hit those marks, and then also for our students who um, are potentially below grade level in their achievement levels, how do we ensure that they're making those growth targets. They will continue that work with our final data reports as I shared. Um, we will be get, get, getting those um, to our schools in the fall um, and that will include that IAR data as well. Initially, each building's instructional leadership team um, meets at the end of the year, sorry that says METS, um, meets at the end of the year to further review data relative to their school improvement pro um, process and then they draft SIP, SIP goals for the upcoming school year. Um, they have another meeting planned in August when they will review that finalized data um, to be included in their SIP goals and planning. Additionally, work continues at the district and building levels to improve growth. So um, in addition to our tier one data meetings and talking about the data, we want to make sure that we have action plans in place. So we have done um, common assessment creation in our um, middle school math department, which we're really excited about. Um, we also have started the use of our forefront platform to review classroom data and make adjustments based on that data. That's something that we're going to continue to support our teachers on as we build out um, that forefront platform in our new ELA adoption that's coming up next school year. Our MTSS protocol, which we referenced in um, the strategic plan update, is was in its first year of implementation and really it was just about starting those conversations, ensuring that teachers were all speaking the same language and asking the same questions about their data. And so we are um, looking for that process to continue and to evolve um, over the course of the next school year as we also continue to talk through our tier two and tier three processes. And then we are beginning that curricular review process for our middle school math department. We think that that's an important component um, of making sure that we are really pushing forward um, with our middle school math um, instruction. So in the fall, ECRA will provide our spring, spring growth reports. We will um, be able to see those um, for both IAR and all of the combined data across the school year. That building level data um, 
will be reviewed by instructional leadership teams and they'll have that review in August and September. And then in October and early November, between board meetings and our curriculum workshop, we'll continue to discuss that spring growth data. So you will see a fall data snapshot um, earlier in, in the fall that typically happens um, in October, or in October at the October board meeting, but then at the um, end of October curriculum workshop, I will do the overall 2023-2024 um, data review. And then at the November board meeting, I will do the um, Illinois School Report Card review as well. Um, we will look at um, our interpretation and response to, the, to that data, including in sharing our building leadership's plan our building's school improvement plans for the 2024-2025 school year. At that time, we will also review our key performance indicators and our goals that the district has, and those will be reported on in October using that aggregate data. And then we are looking to have additional support from ECRA through user groups and building support. So we are um, partnering with ECRA to ensure that we're having conversations with other districts and what's going well um, with their use of the ECRA model um, and, and what we are seeing as successful and questions that we have. So it's really nice to be able to bounce those um, ideas off of each other with the ECRA team um, in order to provide some of that um, platform knowledge. And then we are also going to provide additional ECRA support for our administrative team as well as our buildings. Quick question for you. Of um, course. There's a couple of references you made to the fact that IAR is going to be obviously yeah. merged in. Over the last couple years, we've been seeing kind of a, a separation in mm -hmm. what we're seeing in MAP versus IAR. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they've kind of flipped a little bit mm -hmm. in, in the way they've been over the last couple of years. So we've been seeing some really positive things at, in IAR. In the fall, when kids are coming back and teachers have access to both those pieces, how do we reconcile some of the differences and maybe the performance that we're seeing on, on the state assessment versus some of the work that, you know, the, yeah. the stuff that's coming in. And absolutely. if you don't know now, if that's something we can include in the fall, that would be great. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I absolutely think that that is something that we, that we should have a conversation about when we're looking at, sorry, this started moving. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm sorry, the, the presentation started, the started moving. Oh. So it just needs to go back to its first slide. Okay. I apologize. Um, what, what I would really like to be able to do is have teachers kind of look at the data side by side and say, are we seeing discrepancies there? Where, where are those discrepancies coming from? And what is providing the best picture um, of our student learning? We know that a single assessment data point is not um, the end all be all. We also know that we wanna make sure that we're looking at trends. So if we're seeing trends within our map data, what's causing that? But if we're seeing positive trends um, or vice versa within our IAR data, Let's have a conversation about why that is. And so while we look at MAP to be our growth model, we also want to look at those student achievement numbers, which is what IAR um, is, is giving us, is that grade level um, proficiency. And so how do we make sure that we're reconciling where, um, where we're getting the most information about our students from? I think the other thing, too, that we look at when we're determining interventions is you know, if a student has a low MAP score but a high IAR, we're still going to offer that assistance for a student that may be showing a low uh, MAP score. We don't just dismiss it and say, okay, well, because you had a higher score on this one. So we're going to over support if, if we have to to make sure that uh, the kiddos catch up. Also, um, this is the last year, but we're still offering that for a child that wasn't making growth that we had hoped, we still offer that free summer school um, in session one. For anybody to catch up with any uh, learning loss mm -hmm. but certainly as we get down in the fall and we're looking at why did this child not uh, do as well in math but they did very well in IR that's where you get down to the item analysis and that's where teachers having the dashboard would be able to look at along with their ILT teams you know what standards are we seeing commonality in that perhaps the student is struggling or across the board are we seeing certain things in the math assessment that correlate with the IR let's say they don't correlate, oftentimes it's a matter of timing of when did you teach that content area versus when did you not, depending on. One of the other things that we're looking at with NWEA MAP, because the IAR data, we can't share it publicly yet because it's still embargoed, is very, very positive, again, uh, it, across the board, is the timing of the assessment that we give the, the spring NWA MAP test. And, um, you know, 
is that timing causing our students maybe not to perform as well on that? Uh, that's certainly one factor in it because when you look at when our students take math tests, especially this year, it came at the end of the school year after they had taken the IAR, after the fifth graders took the IESA assessment, and then after our EL students took the access assessment. So certainly there is something there with you know, test after test after test, and that's something yeah. we want to continue to look at. Um, the other piece of information, the difference between the IAR and the NWA MAP test, although MAP will tell you it's correlated to the Illinois state standards, it is a test that's tailored to all 50 states, where the IAR is tailored more specifically to Illinois. And our job is to teach the Illinois standards, so as we're designing curriculum, it's going to hit those Illinois standards harder than perhaps just a natural or a national set of standards. And so that could be an, another piece for some of the discrepancy uh, that we're seeing. But when it boils down to it, it's individual kids. What are they missing in this test? What are they missing in this test? And then how do we supplement it? Perfect, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board? Two. Two for me. First, on um, as we think about these uh, fall, winter, spring snapshots from ECRA, sure. one of the things that's tough for me as a board member is looking at these tests at, as moments in time mm -hmm. and then not being able to remember what was the trend that we noticed from fall and winter, like in essence, like some sort of like time series view sure. of are we seeing a consistent challenge in a particular school or a particular grade level or for mm -hmm. a particular demographic? And I never want to overjudge based on spring or only winter or only fall. Mm -hmm. But when you have three cycles in a row and you start to see something, yeah. that's when it makes sense for us as a board to start to like ask different questions. So maybe presenting it in more of a trend line. And, and I don't know what that should look like, but I'm open to okay. options there. Uh, <laughs> but that's something that would give us a sense as a board of we never want to overreact to spring, fifth grade, just math. Here's right. what's happening. Like, let's not let's not jump to conclusions unless. It was a thing that we've been seeing for four cycles. Um, I just don't go back to each of those presentations when you present a particular season's data. Yeah. Um, that's more that. of a comment. Uh, then a question about, uh, so coming out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. we made a choice to go back to a, every uh, school year doing the three cycles of testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were in a two cycles of testing prior to that. And so I wonder, uh, Kevin and Liz and others on the team, of, uh, should we be revisiting that? And if so, when does it make sense to revisit it? Yeah, so thank you for that question. And that is something that we are going to revisit. It's not something that I'm recommending we change for next school year uh, because we'd like to have some very thoughtful conversations first with our teachers who are in the classrooms. And, uh, but that is something that we are going to look at this year. The reason we didn't um, jump right back to a two session cycle was after the pandemic. We were very concerned with learning loss where our children were at and wanted to make sure that we were providing them with every opportunity. You know, now that we're in 2024, I think it is time to revisit that and just say, you know, are we over testing our kids? If we feel like we are, what's the right balance to still make sure that we're being accountable, to still make sure that we're checking on their growth, but not over testing them to the point where perhaps we're getting diminishing returns or it's not reflecting their ability. And so prior to the pandemic, we um, did different types of testing um, in different cycles of the year. My previous district, we had made the decision to no longer do spring math for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we felt like we wanted the fall to winter math to really be our guide to say our kids on target for the year and that mid-year check, then we can make a determination if they weren't, we can put some things in place and then use that IR assessment to see how they finished off the year. And so that's one option you could do. Another, some districts only do um, you know, fall to spring. The issue if you just do fall to spring, you're putting the IAR and the MAP assessment at relatively the, the same time period, which can throw us right back into that. But to answer your question directly, we are gonna be looking at that with different groups, um, mainly groups like the Curriculum Council and then our grade level teachers as they need to ask that question and to see kind of what's the right balance for accountability and growth, but not over testing our kids. Thank you. One kind of yeah, one question slash comment, I guess, combo on um, how we're analyzing data, how we're using this to make decisions and, and things like that going forward is, um, and we've talked about this before in terms of looking at our scores and kind of comparing that to what we're seeing 
neighboring districts, um, even nationwide data, all, all those types of things, in particular in relation to the middle school and where we're seeing mm -hmm. um, less than expected growth. And I think kind of to Karat's point of saying, do we want to look at this point in time and, and what kind of a reaction do we want to have to that? And I think it, something that I would find valuable would be to look at what are we seeing in terms of growth especially with our neighboring districts at the middle school level, are you seeing a similar trend in a drop in growth when students at the middle school level? Is that something we're seeing sort of across the board, all over the place? I think, you know, we have a couple of middle school administrators, a couple of middle school teachers here in the audience, yeah. people who've taught middle school before. Is some of that just middle school kids they have other things going on, other priorities, they don't have this, you know, and not to say that, oh, middle school kids don't care as much about school as elementary so throw up your hands and oh well of course not of course we still look at it and we address it and we try to make improvements to engage and all those things but is that a reflection of our middle schools or is that a reflection of this is sometimes a, a trend that you see with middle school across the board sure absolutely well and and we do receive our IAR um, comparison report mm -hmm. from ECRA where they will will show um, comparison to our neighboring districts that are of similar size um, mm -hmm. to um, DG 58 and and so that is something that I will be able to share with you in the fall um, as we get those reports available I do think that just one one of the things that we always want to take into consideration is, you know, how are, how are we presenting these assessments to our students? And then let's ensure that they recognize that we use this data to inform our decision making, to determine if curriculum is, is meeting the needs of our district, to ensure that they're in the right classes, to ensure that we're providing the correct interventions and supports and enrichment opportunities to them. So I do think there is some of um, that just conversation about why schools provide these type of benchmark assessments and how do we ensure that the kids have that buy-in for it as well. And Emily, to answer your question too, just from you know doing this assessment for a long time, what we see in NWA is the primary um, level achievement scores are going to be the highest percentile. Why is that? Well, because when you're taking that test as a primary student, I'm talking about the K-2 test, that, that test is basically read to the students. Mm -hmm. And so where we start to see the separation and maybe the, the scores dip a little bit, not just in 58, but nationwide, mm -hmm. is when that becomes a true reading test. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to see very high percentiles in our K-2, and then as that starts to spread out, we see that. One of the problems with the MAP test, um, and this isn't necessarily a problem per se, Liz and I were just talking about this this afternoon, is once you start to get into 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, what we're expecting our students to grow can sometimes be as low as one or two points. So the issue that you have there is, you, if, for those of you who are familiar with MAP, it, it's a Rausch unit of measurement, which, which means it's a scale. And it's not an exact number that a child lands on. If they say you have a writ of 250, which is a very high score, that means you could have scored as low as 247 or you could have scored as high as 253. Mm -hmm. So you've got kind of a six point range. Well, inside of that range then, if you're only expecting one or two growth points, it's very hard to pinpoint. Whereas if you're a primary student, sometimes you're expecting six, seven points of growth. And so it's a little easier to determine. So in general, it gets tougher to make your growth the higher your grade level is and the higher your percentile is because we don't expect the same amount of growth. And often that growth that we expect is within the margin of error. As Darren alluded to, one of the other phenomena that we're seeing in the last several school years is that our IAR scores at the middle school are outperforming what we're doing in math. Mm -hmm. And so our kids are growing in the middle school. Mm -hmm. It's just not reflected on sometimes the MAP assessment as well as it's reflected in the IR. But there are also times with some of our middle school students or cohorts where they're not making the growth that we want to see. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know revisiting our MAP, common assessments, making sure that we're all delivering the curriculum the same way so that we can make a determination. Is it the way we're teaching? Is it a particular cohort of students? That's important as well. But in general, what we're seeing is that our IR performance is showing healthier growth, healthier performance than our MAP data is at the middle school math level. In the ELA, we're seeing kind of more consistency between those two tests, but certainly something that um, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I kind no, of sure. a little bit. Definitely, and I think just also when we talk about, and we've talked about this so many times too, about when we see districts that are showing maybe you know better than expected growth or better than expected achievement 
whether it's a subgroup or mm -hmm. overall or whatever the case may be, looking to them to say, what are you doing? What steps mm -hmm. are you taking? And, and I think for middle school students in particular, where engagement is more of a challenge than for younger students, if we do see districts where their growth seems to be outpacing our growth potentially, what what are they doing? What are, you know? What can we gain from their knowledge and saying? What are you doing to engage these difficult to engage students that might help? You know, it's not necessarily that what we're doing is is not good or is wrong or whatever. But obviously, this is a challenging age group to reach. And so, what can we do? Where can we look for areas for achievement? And also, just to kind of just use national trends, local trends to say this is something that this is an area where you see a dip often because these kids their priorities are, are different than a third graders priorities and, and that's just developmentally appropriate to a point as well and so keeping that into consideration well, and that's one of those great opportunities through the ECRA user groups is really having those conversations. Now that ECRA is, is um, holding those on a more consistent basis, it's really an opportunity to engage with other partner districts. Mm -hmm. and, and we're leading that. I want to thank Mendel mm -hmm. Yoshi. I think he had yeah. a conversation with somebody at I, and uh, ECRA has mm -hmm. really stepped up their user group so we can start answering some of those questions. One of the nice things we have in DuPage County that Liz is a member of and Justin was before, and Christine Priester also goes to these, are those curriculum groups of all of our assistant superintendents or directors of curriculum. And that's one of the things that they'll do every year is they'll look at all the scores across the county and see do we have some outliers um, and to really then go back to them and, and compare what are you doing differently th than we are. What we have found the most success with over the last um, five years is really taking the test seriously and actively proctoring that test. Um, that really does help as a community taking that test seriously does help. And we've seen the difference ever. That only gets you so far. When we go back to our teachers where we find the pockets of success, meaning those are our outliers that are doing so much better. When we talk to them, it really boils down to good solid collaboration with that particular team and paying particular attention to those standards at that grade level in delivering the curriculum the way it's supposed to be delivered, meaning not veer off too much. And again, we want to be careful because we want our teachers to be responsive. But in order for us to diagnose a problem or for us to, you know, continue success, we've got to be able to ensure that we've got that consistent, guaranteed, viable curriculum across in a grade level. And so that has helped us, and Justin talked about this a lot over the last two years, is really staying the course and making sure that we're all implementing in the same manner. So we're excited about the common assessments that we're going to, uh, you know, continue to roll out at the middle school level. That will help us in then really reviewing the curriculum to make sure that we're all on the same page and delivering it in a similar manner, mm -hmm. while of course making adjustments for our kids. But that is what we found has been the most successful recipe and then really aggressively assisting students that are um, still not making growth despite that. And we'll see that, that um, implementation of the ELA um, resources, mm -hmm. our new ELA resources, which we're really excited about. And again, having that consistency across classrooms. So Liz, um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll speak for myself that I, I really have enjoyed so far uh, the ECRA platform. I, mm -hmm. I, I think you've heard kind of praise up and down the board table over the years. Now, prior to you being here, mm -hmm. we had a very different model of doing that. Um, it didn't give us nearly the vision that we have today, but in a crude way what it did because of what we did, um, you could sort of look at the numbers across on an angle and you could sort of deduce the pattern that was going on. You could sort of, by looking at an angle, you could sort of figure out the cohort, like, all right, th there's a weird anomaly happening in fifth grade. Well, that cohort has seemed to have an issue all along, so it's not unique to fifth grade. It's what so uh, to kind of piggyback on what what um, Member Doshi was mentioning, having maybe at the annual curriculum workshop some because now at, at that particular one we have a an entire spectrum including the IAR, Correct. being able to get some kind of it, it some kind of historical look at our, our trends. I'm assuming there's probably something that we can get out of the ECRA reports that would show us some trend lines on on how we're doing in both maybe grade cohorts, um, our subcategories, and our um, and just the grade levels in, in general. Is that kind of what you're looking for, Karat? I think what we can, um, sorry to jump in, uh, Karat. 
IAR gives us some great trend data. In fact, you can just click a button yeah. and it will show three year trend. I think we can replicate that. We know a guy at the district office who's pretty good at those uh, spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I definitely think we can model that three year trend with this three year trend by cohort and by grade and, and just yeah. kind of see, you know, yeah. is that. Uh, there are specific cohorts that we are monitoring. So, for instance, third grade is always an interesting grade for us because we don't really have all of that complete data yet with IAR and so this particular third grade we are looking at because they did not perform you know in terms of achievement as well as last year's third grade so that's one that we want to watch right away we're also monitoring our fifth graders who are in the standard math curriculum right because even though the other kids aren't in the data set the fifth grade standard kids are mm -hmm. the eighth grade group is another one that we're looking at very closely and they still didn't have the performance in math that we wanted on math, but they certainly did on the IAR. And so making progress in, in that area. But definitely I think we can put our heads together with James, with Liz, myself, and, and, and see how we can show that trend data in addition to our standard report that we always get. Yeah, to answer your question, I'm interested in the time series view and less so about what it exactly has to look like. I'd love to see some solutions on like what could it look like especially if it's available through the ECRA platform, so we're not then doing ECRA 2.0. Uh, we also have our Vision 58 version, and now we're going to market as a, back as a company. Yeah. We're not asking for that. Yeah, let's not, let's not recreate yeah. the wheel, but let's see what they can do for us. Yeah, I appreciate you saying it, because one of the cautions that we always want to do, and one of the reasons we went to the current system of reporting is because, you know, we heard from the board, hey, this is great, but each time you guys present, it looks a little bit different, and, and so we need some consistency so we can monitor over time how we're doing. So how do we have the best of both worlds? I think we can keep putting our heads together. Absolutely. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Now we want to bring up Faith to share the uh, brief slides on the climate survey. Sorry for the delay, Faith. <laughs> good evening. It's good to be back here. Um, let me make sure of the right. It's the one. Uh, it's the no, little one. The one you left. The right one. All right. All right, here we go. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about two surveys um, and use the results and how we use the results to improve school operations, communications, and customer service. So as you know, the district publishes its own climate and culture survey. It was open for three weeks um, this spring or late winter. Um, we got 1,045 responses, which is um, lower than normal but not concerning, um, kind of back to pre-pandemic uh, uh, era. So we're gonna uh, publish the results this week on our page um, with redacted comments. So next, um, I kinda wanna talk about the, a theme to these results. So I would say they're pretty nice gains across the board. Um, last year I was here and I talked about how the results just inched up um, very small. So this year we had much higher gains, um, kind of back to pre, you know, pre-pandemic times again. So we had gains of one to three point six points. So of nineteen questions, seventeen showed um, increases, and one stayed the same. And the one that stayed the same, we saw more people that were generally um, in favor of um, always. And it was my child's teacher is. Um, uh, encourages me to come in the classroom for activities. So we saw more people in the always rather than the, the um, usually uh, uh, segment. So we saw one decrease, and that was my child's classroom teacher welcomes um, uh, parents to the classroom for activities. So the end, that was a minuscule decrease. So anyway, so we had 19 questions, 17 show increases, and they were pretty nice gains. So here are the highest responses. Um, and I'm no statistician, of course, but I know that when you get above the 90th percentile, it's, it's pretty hard to go higher. So um, as a parent, I would think those first two, first three uh, questions um, are pretty prime um, examples of what parents want in a school. And, and you should be really gratified that that's what parents think about um, our schools. Next, I just wanted to go a little bit more detailed about what we do with results and how we compare um, data. So just like when Liz was talking about meets and exceeds data for test scores, um, we do the same for how parents and community members look at um, 
usually and always responses. So as you can see, the one on the top, we have a large number of people that um, believe usually that if my child is injured, an adult will help him and her. And so on the bottom is um, parent feedback is considered in the school decision making. And those, we really want to move people from the this, the usually to the always column. So we have a little bit more work to do in that area. And a side note, that particular question did have gains of three points. So next, I wanna show you the largest increases um, in questions. Um, one is my child feels comfortable talking to adults in the school about problems he, he or she may be having at 3.6% 6, and usually and always. And my child's teachers communicates with me about my child's progress. Again, that's 3.6% and usually and always. Um, next is parent feedback. Um, is considered in the school's decision making. That's 2.9% increase. And the last one I wanted to highlight is my child's school welcomes parents to school events and activities, and that's 2.2% increase. So we're really proud of those increases, and again, um, much larger than the previous year. So I did want to go over some of the open question themes. Um, one of the questions that we do ask is what does district uh, 58 do well and that should be continued and what is one thing that district 58 and your school can improve upon so I tagged each there's a there's an ability to do that in the software so I tagged each one for a theme and there were pretty strong themes and like last year um, it's they were very strong communications and communication across all levels the district the school and and the teacher um, and I put in some actual quote quotes in green from some of the surveys and, and they were very praiseworthy. Um, the next one um, was exemplary teachers. Uh, people were raving about teachers and, and really about how they cared about kids um, and how they were very supportive. Um, the one after that was positive school climate. We saw that last year as well. Ten percent of the themes that people mentioned was what, what a welcoming climate the schools had and um, how the schools were really good at building a community. Um, so I've got two slides on this, just because the themes I thought were, were so outstanding. Um, the, the, climb, the next one was caring, or supportive environment, or caring and supportive environment. And that's, that's similar to school climate, but it it's just has a little, um, little bit of a change. Ch uh, children feel safe, supported, um, with a school full of people that nurture them. So we thought that was wonderful. Um, the next one is kind of a new theme that emerged, and it was comments about activities and events for students and parents recognizing that there were a lot of options for kids and that the schools, even though they might have not have sponsored something, but they welcomed it in their school. As you can see, there's someone that mentions Girl Scouts as well as Fun Lunch, um, but in addition, the, the district and the um, school activities. And another category that was mentioned was principals, and, and that was about 5% of people were giving shout outs to the principals and how wonderful they were, um, how they were genu genuine, supportive, and communicative. So the other open theme question was, um, what is one thing the district and your school can improve upon? And like last year, a lot of people said nothing, or I can't think of anything, or no improvements. And it was really hard to tag or put things into the theme because most of the comments were about very individual specific situations about their family or an event that happened. But, but we did find some themes. So again, it was teacher communications. Um, and I think as more teachers communicate, there's more of an expectation for all teachers to communicate. So that was, that was a comment. Um, parents also wanted to have regular progress updates before there was an issue. Um, last year we talked about student behavior and how, how there was a concern about student behavior. That was tweaked a little bit more this year. Um, now um, people are saying they want more teaching about bullying and kindness, which I think the schools, when I'm there, I see a lot of it. But uh, that's what they said in their comments. They want more teaching and bullying about kindness and more staff eyes and ears um, at recess. So another theme that was fairly new was about art and music in the classroom. Parents wanted more emphasis on the arts and also a dedicated art and music teaching space. And the last, and this was similar to last year, is facilities. Um, people recognized that there are improvements going on, um, but there was a concern about continual um, priority um, about facilities and making that a priority. Next, you've seen the slide before. We showed it last year, and that's the National Gallup poll, and it shows an increase in 
dissatisfaction among American schools and an increase, did I say that right? An increase in dissatisfaction and a decrease in satisfaction. So um, if you see those points, those are pretty low there. And, and this district, I really think, is a unicorn um, in being very different from that national um, poll. So what's the next is um, we talk about what we're going to do with it and what uh, Dr. Russell already meets with principals and building leadership teams to review the results. The administrators review them district-wide about school-specific um, data, and the data, again, will be posted online. So quickly, I wanted to go over the communication satisfaction and, preference and survey, preferences survey. I'm not going to go into every question, but kind of give you an overview. Um, as you know, the district has identical questions so they can compare from year to year. Um, there was no survey done last year because we had the strategic plan and there were many questions in the strategic plan about communications and we were also concerned about um, survey fatigue. So this communication survey was also paired with an extracurricular survey so there were many more responses than what we usually get. So results may be skewed um, since it's a much larger sample size, about 30% more. So our goals in creating the survey are the same, um, to measure changes over time, to understand the community's um, satisfaction and preferences regarding communication, and to use this data to inform priorities in communication and decisions. So if there's a theme for communication survey, I would say it's um, a return to pre-pandemic levels. So as you can see, there's a big jump from two years ago with mm -hmm. the question, I am satisfied with the district's overall communication efforts. So it's almost a return to pre-pandemic, just one point lower. Um, so we're really happy with, with that. Next, I wanted to show you three questions that were on there and uh, the improvements that we saw. And again, they were pretty well, then they were just modest improvements over two years ago, but pretty large improvements over 2012, as you can see. Um, here, it, I wanted to, to kind of dig in a little bit about communi communication preferences and frequency. One of the, the things that um, we're always concerned about is frequency of communications, and it's a comment that, that comes up in the open um, comments of the survey. And as you can see, people are more satisfied with the frequency of principal communications and more satisfied with the frequency of district communications. And that's been an effort over the years to reduce the one-time emails and to really consolidate communications. We don't really have control over the PTA communications and the teacher communications, but parents are always, I shouldn't say always, but parents are commenting about where do I find everything and can everything be in one place. So next, I, I, I want to show you what we do with the results. So each year we ask people what topics they would like to see more of, and those are what people said in 2022. They wanted to see more information on new initiatives, on curriculum, and on student support services. So we really try to deliver that. So um, we covered topics and stories and snippets on social media that cover those areas, and the themes that we hit on, on this year to meet those goals was using data to drive improvements, specifically through the strategic plan process. And the second was building relationships as a priority. And the third was creating a nurturing, supportive school environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's all I have, if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank okay, okay, hold on, stay there while you're up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on behalf of the board, the administrative team, you have done such a wonderful job filling in for Megan this last year and a half, and during mm -hmm. COVID when you filled in for Megan's <laughs> first maternity leave. Um, as superintendent, I work very closely with our public relations office, uh, you in particular. I can't thank you enough for all of your hard work, all of your dedication, all of my late night phone calls and weekend <laughs> texts and all of that. Um, you do a wonderful job and we are going to miss you, but we are extremely grateful for all that you've done and hopefully you can have some more free time to go and do those things that you enjoy. <laughs> uh, but you have been a wonderful asset to our school district and I can't thank you enough for everything. Okay. Thank well, you. I
just make one more comment. Like I said, this district is a unicorn. It's it's really different from any other district I've worked with. So um, it's been an honor and privilege, and I said that earlier today, to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, yes, thank you very much. All right, we do have one more spotlight tonight. It is our middle school construction and contingency. So we're going to bring uh, Kevin Bardo up, and I know that, uh, Kevin Russell is going to. We also have our, our partners from Huffman and Keel and uh, Bully and Andrews, who are also uh, here. But Kevin and um, our partners from Huffman and Keel, Eric, uh, will help us with the presentation. Tonight's presentation for the audience and for the board is whenever. Um, we have the board together about every other month. We provide an update on what's going on in construction. And construction is going um, really well across all of our schools. But we do have an overrun at Herrick uh, that we wanted to simply provide the public and the information uh, to the board this evening. You do not have to vote on everything tonight. Uh, we are going to give you a recommendation on how to handle this overrun. But we'll be seeking board approval for that in August. So that leaves us plenty of time to ask whatever questions need to be asked and provide the board with whatever information um, they need. And by August, we should have a pretty good idea then as well, in terms of the phase one elementary schools and the initial projects at both middle schools, um, how they are going after a summer's worth of work. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So um, I'm not gonna repeat uh, too much what Kevin just said, but uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Eric Eichler from our owners construction owners representative team uh, from Huffman Kill Forge. And Eric's going to run through a couple of things, um, which Kevin just referenced about um, kind of a significant issue that we encountered as we uh, started construction over at Herrick. Thanks, Kevin. I'm, o I'm only brought in to talk about the most pleasant topics. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I came directly here from coaching an hour and a half of soccer, so if my voice is a little uh, stressed, <laughs> that's the reason why. Um, so I think you guys have teed up the issue. I'm going to uh, move ahead to the first slide, which is a picture of the conditions before and after, basically. On the upper left, you can see we had to dig out hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of what we're calling unsuitable soils. Unsuitable in that they had lots of old fill from demolished buildings. Just in general, the water table is very high. They were not going to be able to support the weight of the storm detention structure that you see on the bottom right. Um, and then there's a couple interim steps here on the upper right and the bottom left. This next page really, it summarizes hundreds if not thousands of personnel hours that were spent um, between Bully and Andrews, White, our team, the district, subcontractors to try to find a way to mitigate um, what's turning out to be about $400,000 of cost to get rid of the unsuitable material and bring clean stone in. Um, we did do soil borings um, before mm -hmm. the project started. We had some indication that there were issues there were allowances put into the bids um, at Herrick and O'Neill. Once we got on site, um, it turned out to be significantly worse than we expected. We had to go ahead and, and do this work this year because the storm detention system, again, the bottom right image here, needed to be installed this summer because of other utility work that was going to be done on site um, that was serving the existing buildings, relocations, et cetera. Um, so as number two indicates, there was about three weeks worth of meetings on this topic. Um, ben and the team at Bully put together a matrix of about six or seven different options. They were all around the rough, same rough order of magnitude. Uh, the solution that was chosen um, was deemed to be the most cost certain and the least likely to spiral into further costs or schedule issues. Um, as noted, the work proceeded over the past several weeks, a month, and was completed on May 20th. In the long run, there's no impact to the overall project schedule as Number five indicates 
the total cost ended up being four hundred seventeen thousand dollars these costs are mostly based on quantities that were multiplied by predetermined unit prices that were submitted with the subcontractors bids um, as noted in four this is why we have contingencies the biggest risks to the owner are typically in the ground um, at the case of the middle schools it's definitely that when you think of that's about an acre worth of mm -hmm. storm detention that we had to put in um, at Herrick the the other most likely risks involve tying in the new additions um, to the existing building we've talked as a group a bit especially between our team and the district should this be an issue that's funded from the owner's contingency or should it be something that comes out of the construction manager contingency typically in contract administration with a GMP and a construction manager contingency unforeseen conditions underground especially are an owner cost we have a very collaborative and open team here we feel that the CM contingency is best used to respond to um, smaller issues that require quick decisions and not necessarily the subject of a board meeting if we can go to the next slide I can give you a picture of where we are with the contingency today um, on the owner contingency the last time I was here uh, we made several elective decisions to do additional information technology work and upgrade interior doors so you see those uh, those debits to the contingency there has been some buyout savings um, from subcontractor awards or other savings we've experienced in executing the project which is the top line which is why uh, there was a little bit of replenishment and then you see the bottom line um, the Herrick unsuitable soils at 417,000 which means we've depleted a little over 1.3 million of the original 10.3 million um, leaving us with with 9 million overall um, which across the whole program is about four and a half percent the construction contingency summary you can see that um, with the original numbers on the left and the allocated numbers on the right O'Neill is actually has increased um, since the beginning of the project that's primarily interestingly enough due to some adjustments we were able to make to the storm detention system at O'Neill to save money um, nothing to do with soil just a more efficient way of installing uh, the system and at Herrick we've depleted about 25 percent I wanted to highlight the savings at O'Neill because it shows more of a disparity than you would normally see on two very similar projects because of about 200,000 of savings we realized at O'Neill on the storm detention um, and then in the elementary schools thus far we've depleted 11 percent of the construction contingency that's actually fairly good um, for the kind of things you usually learn at the beginning of summer slam projects and between that and the allowances which are not summarized here those um, phase one elementary schools are in a pretty good position um, and then you see the phase two and phase three which are just percentages based on the estimated cost of construction for those schools just a couple of points to piggyback off of um, what Eric had shared with the board. When we look at both the owner's contingency and the construction management contingency, they're both technically our contingencies. And what I mean by that is with a construction management contingency, if Bully and Andrews does not utilize all that, they refund that money back to the district and that would go into the owner's contingency. So they're, they're both our contingencies. I think one of the reasons or the main reason why we're recommending in August that the board vote to take this out of the owner contingency is because if we take it out of the construction management contingency as Eric indicated that is really where those snap decisions where they open up a wall and have to move around a conduit they can make that very quickly 
if we deplete all of that money in the construction management contingency, what that means is as they start to hit those minor details, they've got to stop. We've got to come back to the school board and ask for permission to take it out of the owner's contingency. And you can expect that the project would significantly slow down as a result of that and we wouldn't be able to hit our deadlines. And quite frankly, I'm speaking for myself here, I trust Bully and Andrews, Huffman and Keel, the people that we've hired to make these snap decisions because that is the line of work that they do with our architectural firm. I'm not comfortable making recommendations on where conduit should go and other things like that um, simply because that's outside of our area of uh, expertise. And so that is the reason for the administration's recommendation. It was informed by our owner's representative, Huffman and Keel, our director of buildings and grounds. And so we wanted to bring this up, not to sound alarm bells, <coughs> we certainly still have a lot in contingency, but to just let you know that I don't think any of us are comfortable just taking $400,000 in some change and just taking that straight out of the construction management contingency because we're worried that that would deplete that too far and there's still significant work as Eric shared about tying in the new to the old plus all the work that's going to be taking place in the interior of Eric Middle School. I don't have any more prepared <laughs> remarks. <laughs> the pictures are fascinating, though. I, I think all the kids and the teachers are, what is with all these steel tubes that are laying out there? So at least now we've got some answers uh, to go here. But um, really for the board members, our ask of you is that if you have any questions over the next couple of months, you know, before we get to the August meeting when we do ask you to officially vote, as Eric said, the work had to be done. So right now it technically has been taken out of the construction management contingency. Um, but we're going to come back and ask that we take that out of the owner's contingency. And if you have any questions, concerns, or maybe another way of looking at it, that's why we wanted to give ourselves, you know, June and July to really discuss this and answer any questions uh, before we make a final decision. Okay. Can, uh, can we get a, a breakdown of what's been taken out of the construction contingency so far? What, where, what? A little bit more. Not now, but before August. So that yeah, absolutely. See kind of we. It's labor, I know, et cetera, but we're at 25% on one project, which before, you know, we're not even that far into that project, so I just kind of want to see. What we can do is provide that. We can go back to um, Huffman and Keel, and then uh, ultimately Bully and Andrews, get that information and then provide that in a future update for the board. Thank you. Great, yeah, and that's, that's exactly why we wanted to provide the full two months. So any, any questions you guys have, mm -hmm. um, you can feel free to reach out to to Kevin in the meantime and they can put it in our weekly updates so that come August um, you guys are ready we're ready to take action on it I appreciate you being here tonight thank you thank you thank you sir all right that brings us to reports to the board the first up is the superintendent report back to you well first off uh, it takes a lot to surprise me but I certainly was surprised at the beginning of the meeting so I <laughs> want to thank uh, all of you and uh, you know really as superintendent one of the benefits to my job is you get the award uh, but certainly um, any success that I have is because of the staff that works in the district, the administrative team, and the school board all working together. So I just want to thank you. You know, when I took this job, I'll never forget the opening day speech. I said I felt like I won the lottery, and here six years later, I still feel the exact same way. I was fortunate to be hired in this district as a teacher, even more fortunate to be hired as the superintendent. So I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for allowing me uh, to lead this district. And as luck would have it, my report just disappeared, so bear with me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like having all these eyes on you as you're trying to find that, uh, but I will be. Well, anyway. the lottery feeling's mutual. Thank you. I'll, I'll do some time going for you. Also, Thank you, you very also much. feel like we've won the, won the lottery. So. And I was even more surprised when I saw my kids come in. Uh, yeah. that, that was fun. Okay, here we go. In terms of person. What's that? Yeah. They didn't want to stay at a board meeting. They had their fill watching their dad on TV during COVID, and I think that was <laughs> big entertainment. Yes, exactly. Uh, we continue to make good progress in personnel, especially with the hiring of our teaching positions for the coming year. I want to thank Justin and his team for really working hard. Between those, including on tonight's agenda and the uh, conversations we've had with others, uh, we have attracted some very high quality teachers to already add to our high quality teaching staff. Uh, we do have openings for a number of instructional assistant positions are in the process of recruiting and interviewing uh, for those positions. And so that is going to be a huge focus for us between now and the start of the school year. So please help us spread the word. 
I also want to highlight that later this evening we will ask the Board of Education to ratify a three-year contract with the Downers Grove Elementary Education Association or DGEEA which is our teachers association representing all of our certified teachers we are so grateful that in District 58 our negotiations process is one centered on shared interest and rooted in respect on both sides of the table in the audience, we have several members of the DGEA. I'm very thankful to these dedicated professionals for their hard work on behalf of the students, staff, and families, and then also our community members in the district. I can't, then, I can't thank them enough for all that they do. When I became superintendent again six years ago, you never know who you're gonna get to work with, but it has been a very collaborative and respectful relationship, and I can't thank them enough. We have two former union presidents. We have Craig Young here and Kathy Mayhair, though I think you may have a day or two left, right, Kathy? Uh, <laughs> um, she's counting. As superintendent, whether it's negotiations or whether it is just issues that may arise, I want to thank both of them for their uh, dedication to the teachers they represent and the students and families that they serve. They're two excellent leaders, and um, we want to just recognize them and thank them both. I also want to thank Justin Sissel for his first time going through a Negotiations as the assistant superintendent of personnel. There's no one that I'd rather have leading that initiative in the district, and he did a wonderful job along with James Ike Miller and Todd Drayfall. So thank you to them as well. In terms of curriculum instruction, uh, Liz, thank you for all of your presentations tonight. We do want to highlight that summer school began today with our session one program, welcoming nearly 120 students today. I know Liz and Justin were both out there. As a reminder, session one is for students that might be falling behind. We really utilize that ESSER funding, um, and we'll get to session two and session three a little bit later in the summer, but thank you, uh, Liz, for organizing that. This is your first official summer school uh, that you've overseen, and we appreciate your efforts. Um, in in terms of finance, this is the time of the year where we actually start to receive a lot of our revenue, so we're excited to get that. The district received its second distribution of property taxes on Friday. Uh, it received $22.8 million, or roughly 30% of our tax levy. The district uh, also is in the final process of um, our food service bid. We did want to let everyone know. Uh, we held a mandatory meeting for that bid, and there were three firms that responded, including our current firm, so competition is always a good thing. Uh, we will likely seek approval for that food service bid in uh, July. In terms of technology, the technology department's been working to support the construction projects. Uh, this included moving student devices out of the phase one schools, and we've also uh, moved and done all sorts of things necessary uh, for the middle schools and the phase one office staff. So I want to thank James and his team for really rearranging everything else. I want to thank all of our staff for moving things out. That is not for the faint of heart. Uh, as you know, the building right next door is almost done for us, so we'll be doing that again as an admin team. Um, but it's just another thing on top of everything else and so we want to thank our staff for helping us out uh, with that especially Kevin Bardo and Jeff Newstadt for leading all of that because moving in general is never fun but when you're moving six schools at a time that is not a fun thing to do uh, special services this past week we welcomed approximately 40 staff members and over 100 students to our extended school year special education summer program I know Jacqueline Cadard is here she helps oversee that program along with Jessica Stewart so we want to thank them also SASID's ESY program has also started along with some of our therapeutic day schools so even though it is the summer obviously the learning and hard work uh, continues our students are doing a great job and we look forward to seeing all that they benefit from especially our ESY students it's a really great program uh, that we have I'm going to skip facilities to, uh, do based on everything that we uh, just went over. Public relations. Uh, there were 41 Green Apple Awards presented to staff members this spring. As a reminder, uh, the Education, Found District, uh, or Education Foundation of District 58 sponsors the Green Apple Program, where parents fellow staff members, community members can honor the hard work of our staff members, um, and that's for our certified staff, our non-certified staff, our admin team, our secretarial staff, our custodial staff, everyone has the opportunity uh, to be recognized, and so we're very grateful for that. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, that moves us on to the monthly business and the treasurer's report, Todd Drayfall. <coughs> I will I'll try to be brief. I know we've been lots of reports uh, tonight. Uh, you have the year-to-day report in here. This is uh, we're at 92 percent of the year. We have a month left or a few more days. Um, one of the items you'll note is that even though we're about 92 percent uh, done, we are 80 percent 
spent on, on salaries and you know, 86 on, on, on benefits. That's because when we come to June 30th, we escrow, or I'm sorry, we, we accrue uh, all of the salaries and benefits that we pay in July and August onto the, onto the 630. Um, and our report is actually showing, you know, is a kind of an accrual structure because we're showing the 100% coverage, particularly of all the contract salaries. So when you get the 630 report, which will not be uh, at the July 8th board meeting because um, there won't be enough time to balance, close, and, and to have everything in uh, for the 8th, uh, including which we won't have uh, uh, those final grant reports <coughs> out uh, that we submit to the federal government. I'm sorry, through the state to the federal for the federal grants uh, until that second week uh, of July. So we'll have those in, and once we have that, we will uh, certainly post and get that uh, that year end uh, out to the board with an estimated uh, you know crude balance uh, with with benefit with revenue and expenses. Uh, Dr. Russell pointed out we did receive on Friday uh, um, uh, property taxes. We will receive one more. Uh, property tax distribution at the end of June. Uh, we just heard that actually uh, this afternoon. Uh, another colleague checked in to see how many payments. They haven't sent out a schedule yet, but we have one more coming before the end of this fiscal year. So that will be on par with what we have in past. We do have about a 53% a budget structure of this property tax levy onto the FY24 budget, which is one of the reasons you'll see why if you look through the year-to-date report in the cash, why we're, we're lower um, than we are previously. It's because we have a higher concentration and a higher dependency right now on property taxes as opposed to where we have been, uh, property taxes and federal grants, as opposed to where we've been the last couple of years, particularly because we no longer have the O'Keep tuition, which came in on an every monthly basis. So you have that shift of revenue stream uh, over this last year that has that impact as well as we're continually spending you know the standard format um, and we are a, a lot more current in some of our billing uh, areas um, some of our vendors through COVID and after COVID uh, struggled with uh, particularly talking about transportation um, their management team and their office team often were driving routes and so as a, as a result, ended up with 30 and 60 days behind in invoicing on some of those uh, transportation bills. Those uh, are much the positive part of that they have uh, staffing and they've improved on that is that we have a much more timely bill process. So you have that impact on those things. Um, that's on the year to day report. Uh, we did make a few adjustments. We went through all of this with the uh, Financial Advisory Committee on Friday uh, about um, that cash report where we've taken out the debt uh, service fund and to, to get a better picture and to have a, an aspect of looking at our overall operating funds. On this agenda, um, you also have this is our, our year end and our year beginning. So there are a, a great number of things on there for approval for insurance. Um, uh, bad news, our insurance, our workers comp uh, is up, our property casualty is up. A lot of it has to do with the valuations increasing. Um, for those of us who own homes probably have seen increases in our own insurance on those. Uh, one area that we uh, do have a decrease in, and that is our stop loss insurance. We are a self-funded insurance uh, fund, and as such, we purchase stop loss insurance um, to cap at 175000 in in medical cost per individual. Uh, that has taken a significant decrease over the previous year. So that's a, that's a good positive piece. That doesn't have a direct impact on our expenditures, except that it goes into how our premiums um, will be determined, and that will go into the impact that the uh, Health and Wellness Committee will review and make a recommendation to the board in the fall for our open enrollment um, for January 1st. So you'll see that come back uh, in that aspect uh, when we go through those pieces. Um, other than that, you also have the wellness incentive um, that the Health and Wellness Committee has reviewed uh, and made a recommendation on uh, for a one-year uh, change. We've done two-year change, uh, two-year programs. This is a one-year, so we can work to evaluate and try to increase participation. This is a, a program for. Uh, 
any individual any staff member covered by the plan and their spouse um, and it has a format where you know, a survey and a, a uh, blood test and so forth and goes to a third party for you know an evaluation and it's to catch you know uh, things that are sometimes undiagnosed or some folks that may not you know get to the doctor on a regular basis so that we can help they can find those things and, and obviously from our standpoint uh, lower our long-term costs on that so um, oh, yeah, well, last thing is you have a lease uh, lease agreement with SACID this is a bit lower uh, this year compared to last year the previous years because of the construction in the middle schools uh, we cannot uh, use our middle schools uh, this next year uh, for SACID programs it's a it, this is a very program overall is very good because many of the students are our students and they are in, in our buildings but it's through a SACID program um, we still are going to be leasing out at the elementary schools that we have you know, room and space available for other than that I'll take any questions thank you Todd questions comments do we know which buildings we're going to use for those SACID I think that it's in the yes they we do uh, and off the top of my head I there it's in Hillcrest. the it's in the lease I believe it's Kingsley Kingsley and Hillcrest, Hillcrest. Uh, Hillcrest uh, yes. we can't use O'Neill uh, during construction uh, but we anticipate that post construction we'll be opening up uh, more spaces to SASS thank you that are available. and that was my question so um, they're, they're going to go somewhere else in the meantime are they going to do we have like a kind of another time that want to come back? Yeah, so actually the timing works out well, and I was going to give this update in my SASA report, but if it's okay, I can just do it right sure. now and we can skip it. Um, so one of the desires SASA has is to centralize many of its services so kids aren't traveling to great lengths across the county. We benefit to that because the majority of SASA is located in southeast DuPage County. Um, we couldn't accommodate all of their needs. We certainly always try. The reason for that is we're one of SASA's biggest users and we want our kids who are District 58 kids to attend in, in Downers Grove. So because we can't fully meet their needs, Lyle District 202 has a building that they anticipate will be around for two years. Um, they have to tear it down. It's actually one of my kids' former elementary schools. And so they're going to be located at the former Sheezer Elementary School, many of them. Then when that um, building has to get torn down, then we will have more openings in our district and so we're going to be able to take uh, some of those back. Um, it's the best thing to do for our kids in the program, but also it is a revenue source for our district as, as well. And so we want to capture those dollars uh, if we can. Todd, can you just briefly also mention the July meeting and the timing of that and what that does for our reports? Yes. Um, July 8th is, all, or I'm sorry, the 8th is always the toughest uh, report time because we get we don't have our statements from the banks until the first um, that week we are open the first and the second uh, and then the office is closed for the for the fourth holiday so we wouldn't have any of the information to be able to close um, you know from the statements from the bank and, and and everything between the first and the time that we have to post the agenda uh, for the for the board so Additionally, the, the year end, because we have items that are still out there um, and the accrual piece, and we want to, to go through those, you know, uh, get some time to, to, to wrap those up as well and, and to give the board a, an accurate picture. So we will get those um, about a week later. We will share with the board uh, in the updates what the timing of those are going to be, and as soon as we get them, we'll post those publicly in the matter uh, that we always do. So you won't see all the treasurer's reports like you typically see. Uh, we will then, of course, get back to our normal schedule in August. But all those will be retroactively put on after the fourth holiday for the public to uh, take a look at that, just and given the timing of the uh, July meeting. That's why it worked out that way. And we've and had and that happen before. In July, January. yeah, in, in July is usually, a, I mean, outside of a construction, you know uh, bill payment um, July traditionally is very little uh, activity for us uh, because you know we've closed out the purchase orders for this year you know and the new ones are just starting to to come in uh, you know so we don't really have a huge amount of activity on the payment side uh, of things obviously construction is a different animal because you know we have that kind of going but we have those deadlines and those structures and everyone's adjusting for that Thank you, Todd. Mm -hmm. All right, that brings us to our committees. First up is the Policy Committee, but they have not met. Neither has the Legislative Committee. The Financial Advisory Committee did meet. We met on last Friday, June 7th. Uh, 
I'm going to try to be brief, but I do want to start off by saying we went over a lot. Uh, the meeting went almost two hours, so uh, when it goes that long, it's really hard to keep a quorum. So I really want to thank the people um, that were there, and and um, and uh, because it it went long. Uh, we talked about some of the basic stuff that you're going to see coming up, the Treasury bond, the stop loss insurance, the workers' comp and casualty and liability insurance, all those things, as well as the wellness incentive. You guys all heard about that, so I won't um, uh, deep dive too much into that. We looked at the capital report. You guys have seen that as well. The, the thing that took the most amount of time in the meeting were um, twofold. One was the elementary school lunch program. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the bid process. Uh, this was alluded to already, but it is going to be a two-year plan this time because when we, remember at one point we talked about doing it for one year, and that was because we were going to have to go out to be able to handle the elementary lunch in one year later, but we we pushed that, that a little bit further. So uh, we're going to go out for a two-year. This is not nearly as extensive as what we did when we did this one-year plan with all the taste testing and all that, but that will come back after this two-year term is up. We will do a much bigger bid because that's going to be a five-year plan. And the, the way those plans work is that you're renewing it every year, but you have the right to renew that contract uh, for five years. So um, that's how that works. And the same thing here uh, with, with the two-year one. The other aspect of it is, if you remember, we talked about there is construction that needs to take place in those kitchens. Uh, we've, got a lot more, we've got a lot more information. There's still some information that we don't have. However, uh, the, it looks like the recommendation that's going to come forward, and we'll get some more information on the board on this, is that in the phase two schools to do some of the in-wall, in-ground work right away in preparation for this. That would be, you know, putting <coughs> sewers or grease traps or sinks. The station, the stuff that would become more expensive if we did it later to do that in phase two. Um, when we do it, we are going out to a much earlier bid process. We think that this will be a much more effective uh, process uh, that we go out for. So we're going to see some recommendations around that. We can have some conversation um, prior to that, but that will come in the fall. So we need to start having some conversations around that sooner rather than later, because that would be an, an aspect that we'd have to add into year two. Last up, which was a, a long conversation, was our year-to-date report. Now, a year-to-date report is normally one of those things we do at the very beginning of our meeting. It takes about 30 seconds. We look at a couple of anomalies. However, if you guys are looking at that bottom line number, our low cash point, it is significantly lower than it's been over the last couple of years. This is concerning for a lot of reasons. And um, Todd was able to articulate why we've had some shifts in the way that revenue is coming in. One of the conversations we had, though, is in our September, in our September uh, FAC meeting, we want to almost do like a forensic look at it just to make sure all the predictions that we're expecting are actually correct. But there's a couple of things to note here. There is some stuff that has really shifted for us. One is uh, there was a lot of bills that came late, as he was talking about before. Sometimes we were months and months and months behind in paying our um, transportation because they weren't billing us in any timely manner. They are 100% billing us very timely now, and we've got to be prepared. That's probably you know the future. Dad always jokes that he has no idea how they were able to float so much money out there, you know, being so far behind in billing. I don't think they have any interest in doing that again. So I think that's the new reality that we're part of. We did shift certain items like our kindergarten to be funded purely by our tax dollars. Those we don't get the. $800,000, $850,000 that we once did uh, for O'Keep. But there's a bigger trend that we're seeing as well, and that is our, uh, our CPPRT, the Corporate Property, uh, Personal Property Replacement Tax. If you remember, right around COVID, we saw a massive spike on that. And we were hoping that maybe this was a sign of maybe some kind of uh, new reality as far as revenue, but we we're always a, a little bit afraid we might see a drop off on that. We are seeing a drop off on that uh, quite significantly. I don't know that it'll ever go to pre-pandemic amounts, but we, I think, have to be mentally prepared that that trend is going to continue. So this just reiterates um, so much of why that 35% fund balance is so incredibly important for us. Because had we not been following those rules, we would have been looking at maybe a different situation this year. So it was a very good talk about what we have to do, but we also have to look at and understand what our new reality is uh, with the way our revenue is coming in and the, and the timeliness of our revenue. So uh, the FAC is going to do sort of a post-mortem on this year because we've seen so many changes. And we're going to have to, um, as we look at our 
our five-year plan. We really need to make sure that we're understanding the, the health of year one, two, and three. Obviously, year four and five are a lot harder to keep control of, but that's going to be probably a conversation that we're having quite a bit in the fall and the winter. So just kind of as a, as a heads up on that. Uh, with that, I think that's about all the key items I had. Uh, yeah, so. I was only able to join one hour of the fun, so I missed <laughs> yeah. the, the two yeah. discussion items. But I think, yeah, it's uh, a lot of material, and you know, we just got to continue to right size the amount of time we spent on the information items versus the discussion After items. After you left, one of the items we talked about was we were fl we're going to flip the the discussion items up top. Yeah. Uh, those are some of our presentation items became small discussions as we were going through them, and they they ended up running a lot longer. Uh, so. We think that we are going to make sure that the discussion items are always up top so that if we do um, start to lose people, that we make sure we have the most amount of people in the room and we're having the, the most important conversations. But great recap as always. Okay. I appreciate it. Any questions? The uh, cash on hand difference from this year to last year at the same time is $8 million. Mm -hmm. And we'll get tax receipts. We, are, we already have some tax receipts that came in last week. We'll get another. Right. On June twenty eighth or so. Yeah, we got it. We got it. That'll shore us a backup to our fund balance policy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this low cash point is the whole point of having that, that fund yeah. balance policy in general. So we do dip, we eat it. You know, we start eating that fund balance uh, until we start getting um, those receipts in in you know late May. You know, June is really where we receive the abundance of the, those funds. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's tough seeing a number like that when you're running a seventy million dollar. District. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So appreciate the. Uh, yeah, that's why. Appreciate this, yes. the time spent on this. Yes. Yeah, and I will assure you that uh, not only is the FAC taking this very seriously, but Dr. Russell is taking. But you know, there, there are a lot of eyes in general watching this, and it's one of the reasons why we had some of the hard conversations over the last couple of years yeah. to try to get to where we are um, with, with with managing these numbers. All right. All right, uh, the district leadership team met on May the 21st, so uh, Member Doshi? Yeah, uh, the team stole my thunder, as usual. <laughs> um, we we uh, got a preview of the cover, uh, presentation that they covered today, uh, and so I don't have anything more to add. Kevin, anything that, anything that we should cover from there? No, I think all we're right. all set. Cool. Number one? I was unable to tell oh. that. Perfect. All right, Health and Wellness Committee did not meet. Uh, you, you done with the SAS report? Feel satisfied there. All right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas uh, or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board is allotted 30 minutes tonight. We ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit and give everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I have received one card. Um, so, uh, Put your reader side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sitara. Si yeah. <laughs> I'm getting old. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. I will not take three minutes. I'll be quick on it. But uh, good evening, board members, district staff, and community members. My name is Sitara Seuss, and I am the regional for the Champions Program in Downers Grove. And I am joined by Christina Myers, who is the area manager for the uh, Champions Program in Downers Grove. I just wanted to say a uh, thank you for an amazing support in helping us run quality programs within our community and meeting uh, the needs of our family. Uh, I think it's important for us to at least come up here uh, maybe once a quarter and give an update of what some of the things that we're doing in our program since we are serving the same children, um, uh, District 58 students. So uh, one celebration that I did have is over the past five years, we have not had Illinois DHS audit any of our programs because um, they've just been short staffed or whatever the question has been. But just recently, I am proud to announce that uh, Christina Myers and the 11 schools that she serves received 100% in the health and safety audits for DHS. So that was a celebration in knowing that we are serving and making sure that our kids are healthy and safe within our programs. 
Um, and then we are two weeks into summer and our kids are already creating priceless memories at Pierce Downer and Fairmont. I know it was a challenge to try to get space for us, especially considering that we had over 350 kids signed up and that's only District 58 kids and we had to turn away 50 students that were non-community members. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with that being said, um, we are very grateful in being able to serve uh, the families in need for Champ Camp. Uh, this would not be possible, of course, with the partnerships, without the partnerships from Dr. Russell, Todd, Michelle, and Kevin. Um, these camps are going well. We have two pool days, one field trip, whether it's in-house or out-of-house, and the kids are having a blast and looking forward to some of the things that Christina and team have planned out. Um, as we focus on back to school, we are proud to share, as of today, we have 437 families already enrolled. And uh, once again, we are looking at not having any wait lists and being able to serve as many families as possible for the before and after school needs. Uh, we look forward to the continuous uh, partnership and providing quality service and hope everyone enjoys the summer too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. You. All right, that's it for the cards. Is there anybody else here that would like to make a public comment? No? <laughs> you psyched me out with your movement. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good time. It's like chess. <laughs> Watch out for that light, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Then we just have the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the May 13th, 2024 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the May 13th, 2024 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the May 13, 2024 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to reasons of confidentiality? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. All right. Are there any items? We have a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right. Let's go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Um, in this, we do have a big new hire, so I'm Dr. Yes. Russell. Thank you. Uh, tonight, in approving the personnel report, the Board of Education has approved the appointment of Dr. Steve Perkins to serve as Herrick's principal beginning July 1st, although somehow I think he's going to start a little bit before that. Uh, <laughs> after multiple rounds of interviews that included two Herrick parents and two Herrick, or excuse me, five Herrick staff members, as well as building and district administrators, we identified three strong finalist candidates. After final interviews, we were excited to bring Dr. Perkins' recommendation to the Board of Education. Dr. Perkins is currently an associate principal in Arlington Heights School District 25 and an adjunct uh, instructor at Northwestern's University School of Education and Public Policy. He has been described as a strong, compassionate, and knowledgeable instructional leader who values and seeks out positive relationships among all members of the school community. He has been an associate principal at District 25's South Middle School, uh, a 6th through 8th grade school which has an enrollment of approximately 900 students for the last 8 years. He serves as the lead in all administrative matters for one grade level including coaching and mentoring staff, implementing initiatives, evaluating and hiring staff, running operations and logistics of the building and managing master schedules, which is no easy task. Uh, Dr. Perkins earned his doctorate in educational leadership from National Lewis University, a master's of arts in teaching leadership from Drake University in Des Moines, and a bachelor of arts in education also from Drake. He began his teaching career as a social studies teacher in Iowa. Maybe that's why I liked his candidacy. Um, our interview team members were impressed with his warm, positive communication style, his empathy and humility, the value he placed on connections with students, staff, and families, and his clear investment in education. I'd like to welcome Dr. Perkins to the District 58 team and feel free to come up and say a few words. Good 
Good evening. Uh, I will keep my comments and remarks from my planned 25 minutes down to approximately one minute <laughs> um, as it's getting late. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Dr. Russell. appreciate that. Um, thank you to the board. Thank you to Kevin, Justin, uh, the entire hiring team. I really appreciate that. And um, I'm honored to be serving as the next leader of Herrick Middle School. Um, I am appreciative of the time that everyone has taken um, out of their busy schedules to make this possible. And then to um, echo Kevin's lottery analogy, even though this process has started pretty recently for me, it's felt right ever since it started. So I'm really excited to work with a great staff and a great community, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Very Thank welcome. you. Welcome. Congratulations. All right. Uh, first up, we have a uh, collective bargaining agreement with the DGEEA. Is there a motion to ratify the 2024 through 2027 collective bargaining agreement between the DGEEA and the District 58 Board of Education and authorize the board president and the secretary to sign this agreement? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> we all are. You got that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I want to just make a few comments. Um, I was privilege to have a, uh, a front seat um, view of, of this process. Front seat, back seat. I don't know, I don't know what, the, what the metaphor is. But anyway, um, I was involved and it was, um, it was a lot of work. Um, I would think all in all we probably put in five, six, seven sessions at four to five hours a piece. Some of them going as long as six hours. Um, it was a labor of love for sure, but I, I would, would remark that um, I felt really great in the room. Um, because, you know, these, these labor management issues are often marked by tension and sometimes adversity. And I was able, front row, front row view, that's not That's it, front row seat. And front row view of, of, of the, um, the levity in the room, the rapport, um, the collaboration. And um, I, I just, it's one of those things that just makes me really proud to be a board member um, and, and proud to be a, a community member in, in Downers Grove. I think that uh, just, it just shows, it just shows just how we operate as a community, as, as a district that, um, you know, we can have these really hard conversations and we have on both sides, we have really caring um, and professional uh, leaders who are helping do a really hard job and doing it really well. So thank you, Craig, Kathy and Steve for the work that you guys did. Um, it was certainly a lot. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a thankless job um, a lot of the times, but you, I think you guys did a great job representing your team. Thank you to our team. Um, you guys are fantastic. Um, you know, again, it was um, even, you know, like just the amount of hours that you get worn down, but everybody just was, was committed to um, bringing a great product, uh, a, a great final outcome to the membership of the union and to the, the board and to the community. So thank, thank you all around to everybody. Um, it's something to be proud of. It's something that's gonna um, help the district be in a really good place for the next three years. Um, we are, we are a destination district for teachers and, 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 and educators in general, and, and people want to work here. We want to make sure that we, we um, honor that. And um, we have uh, also, we are at the same time looking to the future and, and respecting the community's investment of their dollars of the district. So um, it's, it's um, something to be proud of. It's, 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 uh, it's over. That's something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. But um, I, I, I'm very glad to have been a part of it, and thank you, everybody. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Thank you. Any comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please cover off. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to ratify the 2024 through 2027 collective bargaining agreement between the DGEEA and the District 58 Board of Education and authorize the board president and the secretary to sign that agreement. Okay. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> All right. Less exciting news. We have a press issue update. <laughs> <laughs> 114 <laughs> policy <laughs> updates. I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah. I have three more woohoos in me. So. Okay. Well, we can celebrate the press update. Is there a motion to adopt the policy updates in press issue 114, uh, 114 as presented? Yes. So moved. Second. Any discussion? This was not as much work. We didn't even have a meeting about this. <laughs> I remember. But still, something to celebrate. <laughs> Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. 
I have the motion carried to adapt the policy updates in press issue one, uh, 114 as presented. Uh, consolidated district plan. Is there a motion to approve the District 58 Consolidated District Plan for the 24-25 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the District 58 Consolidated District Plan for the 2024 through 2025 school year. Next up is the approval of Professional Learning Mondays for the school year 2024 through 2025. Is there a motion to approve the continuation of the Professional Learning Mondays for school year 2024 through 2025? So second. I thought you were second. I, I, I thought I was else. too. Yeah, I was waiting right. for the I next word. All right. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the continuation of the <coughs> professional learning Mondays for school year 2024 through 2025. We have a workers' compensation, property casualty, and liability <laughs> insurance renewal. Is there a motion to authorize the purchase of the insurance coverages listed in the attached memo for the period of July 1 through 2024 through June 30th, 2025, for a total cost of $656,027? Or so so moved. Second. <coughs> Jinx. Any discussion? <laughs> Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Hi. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Wynan. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to authorize the purchase of insurance coverages listed in the attached memo for the period of July 1, 2024 to June 30, 2025 for a total cost of $656,027. We have stop loss insurance for our self-funded insurance policy. Is there a motion to accept the proposal from Sun Life Insurance Company for specific stop loss coverage? for $1,534,280 for the plan year July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2025. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? It was nice to see some savings here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> one more. There we go. Right. One. Melissa, please go. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Aye, the motion carried to accept the proposal from Sun Life Insurance Company for specific stop loss insurance coverage for $1,534,280 for the plan year July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2025. Uh, we have a wellness incentive program. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation for the updated wellness incentive for the 2024 through 2025 school year as presented in the attached memo? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve the recommendation for the updated wellness incentive program for the 2024 through 2025 school year as presented in the attached memo. Uh, we have a resolution appointing a school treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution appointing Todd Drayfall as school treasurer? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution adopting Todd, uh, Todd Drayfall as our school treasurer. We also have a resolution approving a surety bond of treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution approving surety bond of treasurer as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution approving a surety bond of treasurer as presented. Oh, my uh, We have a 2024 2025 general supplies bid. Is there a motion to award the general supply bid for the 2024 through 2025 school year with uh, pricing secured through May 31st, 2025 to Runco Office Supply? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go up. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. I the motion carried to award the general supply bid for the 2024 through 2025 school year with pri uh, pricing secured through May 31st, 2025 to Runco Office Supply. We have an art supply bid. Is there a motion to award the art supply bid for the 2024 through 2025 school year with pricing secured through May 31st, 2025 to school specialty? So moved. Second. Any, any discussion? Let's please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. 
Aye. The motion carried to award the supp art supply bid for the 2024 through 2025 school year with pricing secured through May 31st, 2025 to school specialty. We have a resolution for the nomination for membership of the Downers Grove Plan Commission. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution of nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carried to adopt the resolution of nomination for membership in the Downers Grove Plan Commission as presented. We have a SASID classroom lease. Is there a motion to authorize the administration to enter into a room rental agreement with SASID as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Most please go roll. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to authorize the administration to enter into a room rental agreement with SASET as presented. All right. Last up is a construction consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of the items as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member <coughs> Harris. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Just one announcement. Our next meeting will be Monday, July 8th at 7 p.m., but it will not be here. It will be next door at the brand new Woo Civic Center. Woohoo! <laughs> we knew there was another one somewhere. <laughs> You know, I thought you were going to blow it on the saving that we got in the treasury bond. We did got a surety bond. Treasury <laughs> savings too, but you know, you or the library, the library shelves are woo too, uh, but bright library. So many woo hoos. All right, the, Very the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to close to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees in the district? That's five ILCS one twenty two C one. The collection, uh, collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees, or the representatives, or deliberation concerning salary schedules or one or more classes of employees. It's 5 ILCS 120 uh, 2 C2. The consideration of student disciplinary matters. It's 5 ILCS 122 C9. The placement of individual students uh, into special education programs or other matters relating to uh, individual students. That's 5 ILCS 122 C10. And litigation when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered in the minutes of the closed meeting. That's 5 ILCS 122 C11. Second. And right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess.